Hi, I'm Dan Cordopassi. Today I'm reviewing a two-unit set of Southern Pacific F units from Ather and Genesis. The models in this A and B unit set are both powered, and they're decorated in the as-delivered Southern Pacific Black Widow scheme. Atherin offers these sets in two versions. The MSRP for the DCC Ready version is $459.98. I wasn't able to find an MSRP for the SP version with DCC and sound, but the MSRP for other road names with DCC and sound is $619.98. I got my DCC Ready set from Lombard Hobbies for $344.99. Since there are two locomotives in the set, we'll start the models at 200 possible points. The models come bundled together in a cardboard sleeve. Each model is individually packed in a sturdy cardboard box. Opening the box reveals some literature, including a page with exploded view drawings. Soft foam surrounds a two-piece plastic cradle that holds the model. Flexible plastic on top of the model offers some additional protection against scratches. The trucks have plastic protectors that need to be removed before placing the model on the track. Both models look to be in perfect condition with no broken or missing parts. These are good boxes that should protect the models for storage and transport. EMD's FP7A was similar to the standard F7A but was 4 feet longer. The additional space was in the forward portion of the engine compartment. This space allowed more room for boiler water tanks used to make steam back in the days when passenger cars used steam heat. My unit, 6449, was from an order of 16 FP7A units delivered to Southern Pacific in early 1953. At the time, SP was still mostly using steam on non-streamlined passenger trains, so these FP7A units were mostly used to haul freight. After SP retired its last steam locomotives from regular service in late 1956, the FP7s were used regularly in passenger service. The FP7As replaced Alco PAs on the overland route in the early 1960s, Many were fitted with icicle breaker bars to deal with winter conditions in the snowsheds over Donner Pass. Many of the units were permanently fitted with plow pilots around the same time. The model has the plow pilot, but no icicle breakers. At least some of the FP7As were eventually repainted into scarlet and gray. I found photos of 6449 online from 1966 and 1970. Both show it in scarlet and gray paint, so it lost its Black Widow paint scheme sometime before the 1966 photo was taken. In the 1966 photo, the unit also has icicle breaker bars. These photos show 6449 with additional grab irons on the left side and the front, forming a ladder to access the windshield area. Looking at photos of other SP FP7As, it appears that these grab irons may have been added by SP at some point after the locomotives were already in service. With the Black Widow paint, pilot plow, and lack of left side grab irons and icicle breaker bars, the model appears to best represent 6449 as it would have appeared early in its career. Most of SP's FP7As were sold to Amtrak in 1972. SP6449 became Amtrak 113 in 1973. F7B8295 was delivered in early 1953. It's worth noting that there wasn't an FP7B model, as the regular B units had plenty of space inside for boiler water. According to the Southern Pacific Diesel Locomotive Compendium, this unit had its steam generator deactivated and was downgraded to freight service in the early 1960s. 8295 was retired and traded back to EMD in 1972. The paint on the model is opaque and thin enough that it allows the surface detail on the shell to show through. The markings are mostly crisp. The engines don't have a lot of small stencils, but the stencils they do have are legible. My one complaint is that the separation line between the black and silver on the front of the A unit is a little fuzzy. I think this looks a lot worse blown up on video than it does in person, but it's still out of keeping with the overall quality of the other markings, so I'm taking five points. One thing I really like is that the models have a matte finish. This looks more realistic than a glossy finish, in my opinion, and saves a step when it comes to weathering the model. The freestanding vertical grab irons on the units appear to be made of wire and are nicely painted in white. In places, you can see through the photo-etched grills on the sides of the units, a neat effect. The round porthole windows have flush-fitting glazing, and the fuel tank area details are nicely done. It's hard to see, but the trucks have separate wire brake lines. In front, the A unit has a lot of detail, including separately applied windshield wipers, sunshades, side mirrors, freestanding grab irons, an MU door on the nose, plow pilot, hoses, and an uncoupling lever. The lifting lugs on the front of the A unit are a particularly cool detail. The number boards on the nose have numerals behind glazing, though they don't appear to be lighted. Likewise, the class lights are not functional. I like how the headlight has two individual lenses inside, just like the real thing. It's a little hard to see, but the oscillating light also has a vertical separator through the outer lens, just like the prototype units. The Southern Pacific Line's shield on the front is very nicely done. A green-painted cab interior is visible through the flush-fitting cab windows. 
The rear end of the A unit and both ends of the B unit have unit numbers, hoses, and uncoupling levers. I really like how the striker plates around the end doors are separate parts. On top the unit has a very nice horn casting and more freestanding grab irons. The fans are very nicely done with delicate grills and silver painted fan blades. The steam generator area looks really good. There are small lift rings in this area as well as on other parts of the roof. Underneath there's enough detail for the models to look good when sitting on the track. All the axles are powered and all the wheels pick up current. The wheels are metal with the standard RP25 tread profile. I found some moisture on the bottom of the trucks on my units, possibly a little excess lubricant. It feels like light oil. The models have McHenry plastic knuckle couplers on both ends. Looking for a match on the horizontal center line, the front coupler on the A unit is slightly high, so I'm taking 5 points. The rear coupler on the A unit is low, so I'm taking 5 points. The front coupler on the B unit is low. The rear coupler on the B unit is at the correct height. All the wheels on both units are in gauge according to the NMRA standards gauge. Neither unit has any issues with body wobble. The A unit weighs 18.3 ounces. The B unit weighs 16.4 ounces. My best drawbar pull attempt with the A unit topped out at 4.7 ounces, excellent for a diesel of this size. The best attempt with the lighter B unit was 3.5 ounces, still really good. With both units together I measured an impressive 8.1 ounces of pull, to the point where it was getting hard to physically hold them back. The A unit has LED lighting. The headlight and oscillating light come on when the engine moves forward. They are often reverse. The oscillating light doesn't actually oscillate on DC. There is no backup light, nor are there any lights on the B unit. Since the track was still set up as I was making this program, I decided to try the engines out on our HO scale holiday layout. They're very smooth and quiet, and the A and B units play nice with each other. These engines had no trouble with the 21 and 5 8 inch radius curves we were using. For those of you who have older Athern Genesis F units, the disassembly procedure for these new ones is slightly different. You no longer need to try to spread the shell to the sides, and in fact that won't work. I actually tried that before finally deciding to read the instructions. To remove the shell on the A unit, first remove the front coupler. I was unable to pull the entire assembly through the plow pilot, so I had to remove the draft gear and coupler one piece at a time. The tops of the draft gear boxes have a little pin on them that fits into a hole in the frame. This is to keep the box from turning. Be careful not to break this piece off as you remove the box. The instructions also recommend removing the rear coupler. The rear coupler on the A unit and both couplers on the B unit are much more accessible. There are a couple small screws on either side of the rear coupler mount. These also need to be removed. I should mention that the B unit has these screws on both ends. With the screws out, lift up on the rear of the shell and slide it forward at the same time. Be careful of the headlight wires. The models have 21 pin dummy plugs on the main circuit board. If you want to install DCC, remove the dummy plug and replace it with a 21-pin DCC decoder. There's a notched area at the rear of the frame that's plenty big enough for a speaker if you want to add sound. Because it's my preference, I'm going to replace the stock couplers with KD-158s. These fit into the factory draft gear boxes. If the coupler ends up too low, you can file some material from the mounting pad on the frame. Be careful of small details while doing this. If they're too high, a small scrap of thin styrene could be cut and used as a shim. So even though I normally model the 1990s, I do like to have some vintage equipment around. I'm hoping to eventually use it for photo freights on my Donner layout, and I think these two engines will be perfect for that. Let's see what we've got. The separation line between the silver and black on the A unit was slightly fuzzy, so I took 5 points in the paint and detail category. There were some coupler height issues, so I took 15 points in the standards and operation category. That leaves us with 180 out of 200 possible points, which averages to 90 out of 100, or an A- on a report card. Individually, the A unit scored 85, and the B unit scored 95. Overall, I think these are really nice models, and they deserve a green signal. I think Athern did a really nice job on these engines. It's nice to see that they're continuing to improve the already good Genesis F7s. If you like this video, then please like, comment, share, and subscribe. Stay tuned, and thanks for watching.